Today we're going to meet a man who was in middle management in the military, middle management guy, which got me thinking of uh, The Office, that classic sitcom. There was middle management there. Of course, Michael Scott was middle management, right? He had people above him who were reported to, but he also was over the office. But the funnier part is Dwight Schrute wanted to be middle management. So if you remember, he would refer to himself as the assistant regional manager, and then Michael Scott would always correct him, it's assistant to the regional manager. Big difference, we've added the word two in there. You're not the assistant regional manager, you're the, manager, you're the assistant to the regional manager. Anyway, if that show is not funny to you, then I'm sorry, I'll pray for you. But that's, no, I'm just, just kidding. But I got to thinking about that because this man who takes up the bulk of the scripture that we'll see today in verses 5 through 17 of Matthew chapter 8 was in fact a centurion. He was a military guy and he both had people in authority over him, but he wasn't a scrub. He also had a leadership position of his own um, and we will meet him today and see what Jesus does in his life. But he's not the only one in this passage whose life is impacted by Jesus. There are other lives that will we'll meet uh, more people. We just read about some of them. There's actually this blanket statement at the end of the passage that there are many who were transformed by Jesus. And what we'll see through all of these encounters today is this. Those transformed by Jesus sometimes, sometimes display commendable faith. The faith of the centurion today we'll see is commended. But all the more important than the levels of their faith is the object of their faith. Get that today. That's the main point. More important than the level of your faith, the intensity of your faith, the magnitude of your faith is the object of your faith. All sorts of people are changed in the gospel, but the change agent never changes. It's always, always Jesus. Father, today what we know not, please teach us. What we are not, please make us. And what we have not, please give us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Matthew chapter 8, verse 5, we meet the centurion first. He takes up the bulk of the verses today. Or this encounter that Jesus has with him takes up the bulk. When he, Jesus, had entered Capernaum, he's come down off the mountain from the Sermon on the Mount, and he's re-entering into Capernaum. Last week we learned about a, a meeting he had with a leper, uh, who he healed, came to him, and, and Jesus healed him. Now we read of an encounter with a centurion. He came and he had entered, uh, when he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him. Now real quick, just to reset us in geography, because I think it's so important that we remember these are real stories about real people in real places. This isn't some fanciful Sunday school lesson. These are real accounts. And we talked a little bit last week about how every part of Scripture, some of its poetry, um, some of its metaphor, we have to respect the genre. So not every bit of it is like the way we perceive a history book today, that it's just dates and exact details. But the events described in Scripture are historical events. They truly happened in real life. And so that's a map of... Uh, the nation of Israel in the days of, of Jesus. And if you zoom in, you'll go up to the north where, where Galilee is. That little purple uh, circle there was a region, right? So you have the nation of Israel, then you have a region in the north called Galilee, and that little body of water in the center there is the Sea of Galilee, and at the very top of it was a small town called Capernaum. A lot of what happens early in Matthew happens in that region and specifically in Capernaum. So geographically, that's, that's where we are. So he comes into Capernaum, and there he meets a centurion. Now that word should sound familiar if you think of the word century, a hundred years, gives you a clue to what his title originally meant. His title originally meant a leader of 100 men. Now, likely by this time, the Roman government had not been that exact with it anymore, but he was, in fact, over a group of soldiers, probably in that range of 100 men, but maybe not exactly 100 men. This is who he is. He's literally middle management in the, mil in the military. He reports to some people, and some people report to him. 
That's not derogatory. That's legit. If you've ever served in the military or you know someone who has, that as you, as you rank up in the military, right, unless you're just born with great connections, that requires hard work and effort and energy and commitment. So this is who this man is. Another thing to notice real quick, and I just want to spend time here for the sake of uh, honoring the integrity of Scripture. Matthew writes differently than the other authors in the Gospels. And if you're a careful reader of the Gospels, then when you read Matthew's account of this story and then read Luke's account of this story, there might be some things that make you think, well, uh, what? Why does, why does Luke tell it differently than, than Matthew? Specifically this. Today we will, Matthew writes that the centurion brings this message to Jesus, but in Luke... There's religious leaders who come on behalf of the centurion. And then later, there's friends of the centurion who come on his behalf. In Luke, there's no mention of the centurion actually coming and, and speaking directly to Jesus. So what gives? That's a fair question. And, and, and the Bible is strong enough to handle your questions. And, and, and again, the more carefully you read the scriptures the more questions you'll sometimes have like that. I just want to remind us of a few things about Matthew. Matthew is condensing most of his narratives down to the, to the brass tacks. Like that's kind of his MO as you read through. There's not a whole lot of details. He just kind of puts it down. He gives a lot of his time to the teachings of Jesus. And he takes these narratives and kind of condenses them down. That's a, that's a um, literature, an, off, an authorial choice. He's the author. He's writing this out. He's divinely inspired. But if you, if you read the Word of God, you'll see that the way God divinely inspired these authors was to write through their own hand. That's why the styles of these books are different. And that's what makes Scripture so enjoyable and, and wonderful is all the different genres and all the different styles and all the different authors. Completely, 100% inspired by God, but inspired in such a way that it comes out in their unique personality, their unique way of writing, their unique experiences. Just like us in the church, we all serve the Lord, but uniquely with our giftings and our talents and the things that we're called to. The scriptures are the same. Matthew's also not concerned about exact chronological order. The events in Matthew are, are more topically arranged instead of chronologically arranged. We get uncomfortable with that because, again, it's America. We just, we have our calendars are to the hour, right? Like, you know, day one, this, this, Monday, Tuesday, we've got it all planned out. And, and so that makes us uncomfortable sometimes, but that's how he writes. He lumps them together more topically. And then uh, he's not always concerned with all the specific little details of every story. Again, I say that to comfort us, right, and answer big questions that we might have when we come to reading the Gospels. And we should have these questions, but there's good answers to them. So Luke tells us the religious leaders come on behalf and then the friends come on behalf. But the centurion never does in Luke. And we're obsessed with these precise details oftentimes. But in this example, we have to understand culturally, and it's true, we would understand this with an ambassador from our country. They go to another country and they speak on behalf of the president. They speak on behalf of the United States. And you would hear what they would say and you would say that's, you would never say, that's Ambassador John Smith's policy. You would say, that's America's policy. These are the policies of the President of the United States, even though he didn't speak them. Right? Like he, the ambassador spoke them. The ambassador presented them. So what's probably happening with Matthew is Matthew is leaning hard into that reality within culture that since these people are the ones who came and spoke on behalf of the centurion, it's him that's speaking. He's speaking because these are his words. Or perhaps the centurion shows up as the third party in the list of, of events. It could happen anyway. Just don't worry too much about it. The integrity of the scripture stands. The appeal of the centurion comes to Jesus, and that's the more important part. Here it is. He says, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. We spent some time on this last week. We're not going to hash it out as in-depth this week, but notice again the approachability of Jesus and the willingness of Jesus. 
The centurion has strong faith. It'll be commended. He certainly does. He's courageous in the request that he makes. The leper last week was bold in his request as well. So certainly they had courage. Certainly they had boldness. But there was something about Jesus, the way that he lived, the way that he acted, that made people feel that they could approach him, that they could come into his presence and receive his power. Sometimes you've met powerful people in your life, maybe that you don't feel like you can come into their presence. And maybe you've met people who you feel like you can come into their presence, but they don't have a whole lot of power. Jesus has all the power, and he invites us into his presence. Not only that, but he's willing. Last week he said, I will, to the leper. Remember, I will be clean. Today he says, I will come and heal him. Take me to your home, centurion, and I will heal him. But here's where the narrative takes an unexpected turn. You expect the centurion to be like, okay, let's ride. Let's do it. Let's go. But he doesn't. Instead, in verse 8, we read this. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. He says, don't come. I'm not worthy for you to come into my home. Verse 9 He speaks to why he thinks that Jesus can heal with just his word, even from a distance. He says, for I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I'm middle management. I get this. I get how it works. I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. He understands authority and how it works. But the authority that he attributes to Jesus shows that he's beginning to really understand who Jesus is because what he's insinuating in the words that he's saying, again, if you read carefully and pay attention, is he's insinuating that Jesus is at the top of the organizational chart. That's what he's saying. He's at the very tip top of it. This man must have been convinced of this because, the, uh, because his illustration, which is plain and obvious, is preceded by a massive faith claim that Jesus can speak words and someone's body can be healed. That's massive, right? This flies in the face of the cultural beliefs of the day, by the way. We don't even believe in healing anymore, uh, but they did then, but they believed that healing had to be through the touch of the person who was doing the healing. That's what the whole culture would have believed. This centurion flies in the face of that. He says, you've got so much power, so much authority, you don't even have to touch him. You speak the words and it'll be done. But more important, the centurion is saying, I'm over some people and under some people, but Jesus, you're above all the people. And not just all the people, but you're above disease. You're above human bodies. You're above sickness. You're above paralysis. You're above even the cells of the human body. You're over it all. And when you speak, the people and things that you speak to have no choice but to obey. Indy Wilson puts it like this. I'm not a fan of every single thing that he's put out. I shouldn't have to say that, though. That should just be, we should understand that in this church. We're going to quote people in here. We don't agree with everything they say. But this was good when he said this in notes from the Tilt-A-Whirl. He said, I look around the world and I ask myself, what is it made of? Here's his answer, words, magic words. This is fanciful. This is poetic. If you're not into the poetry, then sorry. The world is made of words, magic words spoken by the infinite, words so potent, spoken by one so potent that they have weight and mass and flavor. They are real. They have taken on flesh and dwelt among us. They are us. In the Christian story, the material world came into existence at the point of speech. And that speech was ex nihilo, meaning from nothing. God did not look around for some cosmic goo to sculpt or another God to dice and recycle. He sang a song, composed a poem. You yourself, he continues, are spoken. I am am spoken. We stand on a spoken stage, the spinning kind, the round kind, the moist kind. Everyone's favorite word, moist. (laughs) The kind of stage with beetles and laughter and babies and dirt and snow and fresh cut cedar. Then he goes even narrower. You are made of cells. 
I am made of cells. My cells are built on molecules. My molecules make use of atoms. My atoms are mostly space, but the bits that aren't are called quarks. Get this, my quarks, the tiniest discovered part of your, human, of your uh, biology is standing because they're obedient. Do you believe that today, that it is the word of God that holds it together? They've been told by a voice they cannot disobey. He goes on, I'm real, I'm heavy, I'm matter. Cut me and I'll bleed, but I'm not made of anything. If the magician, the poet, the word, if the singer were to stop his voice, I would simply cease to be. That's the power of the authority of Jesus. John, the apostle, said it like this. In the beginning was the word. Jesus. In the Word, Jesus was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. The Apostle Paul takes it further. Colossians 1, 15 through 17, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. So far we've, we've seen the same thing that John told us in his gospel, but then he adds this line, and in him all things hold together. Not only did his speech create everything, but it is his speaking that holds everything together. Here's the point. If Jesus never speaks, nothing you see around you would have ever existed. That, could, that sounds like such a fairy tale, doesn't it? I mean, we can be honest, right? Like it kind of sounds like a fairy tale to us, but that's what the scriptures claim. And we're called to grow in our faith to believe that it is literally the voice of Jesus that brought all of this into being. And not only that, but if you ever stopped speaking, if you ever stopped sustaining it would all cease to be. In a real sense, your heart is beating right now because the Savior sings, because he keeps speaking. He keeps sustaining. See, we, we walk in here, we're not that desperate for Jesus. I'm not. I'm going to just be real, right? Like, oh, you're holding my whole being together. <laughs> like, it all just like, like the skin would, you know, like, what is it, the Avengers where he snaps and everybody turns? Like that, that's kind of in my mind what I imagine, right? Like if Jesus stops sustaining all of this, we just pff, be gone. We must be desperate for him. So this Gentile centurion who has no formal training in the things of God has faith to believe that Jesus can speak transformation into reality and Jesus recognizes this. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. This man gets it. We don't know how deeply he gets it. We don't know how sound his theology or his doctrine was. But we see that he had faith that Jesus had the authority to speak transformation into existence. He believed that about him. And Jesus says, I have not seen anything like that even here in Israel, which is kind of a point that he's trying to make. Verse 11, he says, I tell you, many will come from east and west to recline at the table of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And what he means is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, are the, the, the Jewish people are the descendants of them. That's, that's where everyone, his primary audience there in his ministry would have been Jewish people, the descendants of them. And he says, it's not just going to be those ethnically from the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that sit at the table. There's going to be more from the east and the west. And the centurion testifies to that reality. He says, you see, that faith in him was not, get, was not like manifested out of his own self. That was placed into him by a God who has said from the beginning that his plan is global, to save people from every tribe and tongue and nation. And it's a good thing it is, right? Because if it wasn't that way, there wouldn't be any of us Appalachian knuckleheads in the kingdom. But we are, by God's grace. He's saying that this man is evidence of God's global plan. He goes on, though, with a heartbreaking counterpoint. He says, when the sons of the kingdom, he's referring to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
He says, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness, and that place will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's drawing attention to the reality that so many of the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will miss the Messiah right in front of them. And that what we do with Jesus matters deeply. There's eternal consequences to what we do with Jesus. There's a real, literal, eternal punishment awaiting those who look at Jesus and say, no thanks, I'll do it my way. There are consequences to that. And they are eternal and they are devastating. Hell is the word used to describe that eternal separation from the presence of God so intense that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, not just for a day, but forever. Heartbreaking reality. But in the midst of there is also that silver lining of joy that includes us, Gentiles being brought into the kingdom of God. Jesus then turns to the centurion and he says, Go, let it be done as you have believed. And the servant was healed that very moment. Jesus just says, Let it be. And it is. That's his power. The physical properties of the centurion's servant are changed by the voice of Jesus. But watch what happens next. And I love that Matthew puts this story right up against the other one. Because there's just been this massive proclamation that now Gentiles are going to be welcomed into the kingdom and many descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are going to reject it. But almost as if to remind us, but not all of them will, he takes us to a Jewish home. Peter, his disciple, is married. And his wife's mother is very, very sick. That's where he goes next in verse 14. When Jesus entered Peter's house, the, the mother-in-law was very Appalachian. My mother-in-law lives at my home. I guess Peter was the same. His mother-in-law lived at his house, at least during this time, of sickness. She was lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she rose and began to serve him. By the way, notice that she was certainly Jewish, but not only that, she was on the fringes of the inner circle of, of, of Jesus' life. Jesus loved his disciples to the end, he proclaims in the book of John. He says, I love them to the end. And Peter was one of the closest to Jesus. There's no doubt this friendship love that he had for Peter extended to his family as well. And he tenderly touches his mother-in-law's hand and she is healed. These two people could not have been at polar opposite ends, uh, more polar opposite ends of the spectrum. A Gentile outside the people of God, no formal training about God, and a complete stranger in human terms to Jesus. Of course, Jesus knows him because Jesus is God, but they never met in person. He's, he's as distant as he could possibly be. And then there's Peter's mother-in-law, as close as one could possibly be a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They could not have been more different, but Jesus isn't done yet. That evening, verse 16, they brought to him many, many. No number, no exact number. Many, lots, who were oppressed by demons, and he cast them out. He cast out the spirits with a word, with his words, and healed all who were sick. Now we have demon-possessed people, people who aren't just sick well, like kind of outwardly, physically, but they're sick spiritually. They're dominated by spirits that are not of the Lord. And he heals them, and he heals sick people. Before that, we saw the leper last week. Many more are coming in uh, Matthew chapters 8 and 9 who will be healed. And in reality, all these people were likely from all sorts of economically, politically, geographically, and situationally different places. We've seen that. We saw the polar opposites, and there's probably people from every space in between. And not only that, 
But at least in this passage, there's only one person who, whose faith rose to the point where Jesus publicly commends it. You see, he points out this commendable faith. But even in doing that, he's pointing to something greater. He's pointing to the plan of God. He's pointing to the work of God, the kingdom expansion of, of God. But only one's faith is commended. The reality is they probably had all sorts of different levels of faith. They weren't all like faith heroes. Some of them were like barely hanging on faith. Those transformed by Jesus sometimes display commendable faith. But all the, most, all the more important than the levels of our faith is the object of our faith. All sorts of people are changed in the Gospels, but the change agent never changes. It's always Jesus. I was gonna tell. I was gonna try to tell this story to you that I heard another preacher tell one time, but he'll do it way better than me. If you've ever heard of D. A. Carson, what he's gonna talk about in this video is a short video. It's a compelling image, and I want you to just hear him share it instead of me. But it's a compelling image that's rooted in that final night that the Israelites had in Egypt before the Exodus. When that tenth plague comes and the firstborn son is to be slain and God says to them, if you want your firstborn son to live, take the blood of a lamb and put it on the side doorpost and on the top of your door and then the death angel, when he comes tonight, will pass over your home. Listen to D.A. Carson describe this. Picture two Jews by the name of Smith and Brown, remarkably Jewish names. <laughs> the day before the first Passover, having a little discussion in the land of Goshen. And Smith says to Brown, boy, are you a little nervous about what's going to happen tonight? And Brown says, well, God told us what to do through his servant Moses. You don't have to be nervous. Haven't you slaughtered the, the lamb and daubed the two doorposts with blood, put blood on the lintel? Haven't you, you done that? You're all ready and packed to go? You're going to eat the, the whole Passover meal with your family? Well, of course I've done that. I'm not stupid. <laughs> but it's still pretty scary. When you think of all the things that have happened around here recently, you know, flies and river turning to blood, and it's pretty awful. And, and, and now there's a threat of the firstborn being killed, you know? It's all right for you. you got three sons. I've only got one. And I love my Charlie, and, 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 and the angel of death is passing through tonight, you, you, you know? I, I know what, what God says, and I put the blood there, but, but it's pretty scary. I'll be glad when this night is over. And the other one responds, bring it on. I trust the promises of God. That night, the angel of death swept through the land. Which one lost his son? And the answer, of course, is neither. Because death doesn't pass over them on the ground of the intensity or the clarity of the faith exercised. But on the ground of the blood of the Lamb. That's what silences the accuser. The blood silences the accuser of the brothers as he accuses us before God. He silences our consciences when he accuses us directly. How many times do we writhe in agony asking if God can ever love us enough, if God can ever care for us enough after we've done such stupid, sinful, rebellious things, after being Christians for 40 years? What are you going to say? Well, you know, God, I, I tried hard, you know? I, I did my best. It was, a, it was a bad moment. No, 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 no. I have no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. We overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. There is the ground of all human assurance before God. There is the ground of our faith, not guaranteeing intensity of faith, so fickle are we, 
It's not the intensity of our faith, but the object of our faith that saves. They overcome him on the ground of the blood of the Lamb. Those transformed by Jesus sometimes display commendable faith. But all the more important than the levels of their faith is the object of their faith. All sorts of people are changed in the Gospels. We met some of them today. But the change agent never changes. The constant throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is Jesus. He's the one who does it. And that was always the plan, that final verse 17 of our passage today. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illness and bore our disease. Matthew's quoting from Isaiah 53, verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. God told us that Jesus would do this through Isaiah 700 years before it ever happened. And now the, the day is here and being described in Matthew. In Matthew chapter 8, God is put on flesh and dwelt among us, come fulfilling Isaiah 53, 4 through the physical healing of people, and not only the physical healing of people, but more importantly, our eternal sickness as well. You see, that prophecy continues in Isaiah 53, 5 through 6, says he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus came not only to bear the physical infirmities and the demonic possession of the people mentioned in this passage, but to bear our sin to the cross. Not just some of it. All of it. Every thought, every shameful thing that you've said behind someone's back, every good thing that you've done with, with selfish motives in your heart, every single thing, Jesus put it on his back. You couldn't have carried it. I couldn't have carried it. And that's okay. That's what it means to be human. Jesus could, and he does, to the cross. And they put nails into his hands and into his feet, and by his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus dies in your place. Jesus dies in my place, and blood spills out of his hands and his feet. And the, the Bible is simple and his explanation that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all our sin. And Jesus doesn't stay dead. He's raised to life and power three days later. And he says now, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Believe and be saved. If you're not a Christian, trust Jesus today and be saved. And Christians, where are you placing your faith? You might say, duh, Jesus, obviously, I'm a Christian. Well, true. You've placed your faith in Jesus for salvation. But what about today? What or who are you placing your faith in today? Oh, no, I didn't ask how strong your faith is. I asked what's the object of your faith. Is it your career? It's not mine, that's for sure. <laughs> that's a joke about being a pastor, get it? <laughs> Is it a relationship? Is it finally gaining control of something in your life that seems chaotic? Is, is that what you're putting your faith in? Is it having success in something? Is it, is it finding comfort or adventure or distraction? Where are you placing your faith? Is it a political outcome? Is it providing a good life for your children? On and on we could go. There's a thousand places we could begin to place our faith that isn't Jesus. And some of those things I just talked about are good things. They find the right place. 
in the order of priority, where are you placing your faith? Is it Jesus? It's the reality that if you are in him, he is with you. And if he is with you, who can be against you? And if he is with you, all the promises of God are yes and amen for you today. Is that the object of your faith? What or who is it that you're placing your faith in? Not how intense, but what is the object? I'll close with this, John 6, 67 through 69. I love this passage. Jesus has taught some really hard stuff, and, and when he finishes teaching it, everybody except his closest disciples leave. I keep, there's this part of me that keeps waiting for that church service to happen. Everybody's like, yeah, I don't know about this, kid, this church. And next Sunday I show up and it's just me and Josh and the Bokels and the Earlies. Maybe some of our deacons show up out of obligation, right? But the rest of y'all are just like, oh, we're done with this. Jesus turns to his disciples, to the 12, and says, do you want to go away as well? Some Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, no way, this is the best time I've ever had in my life. Jesus, yes, sir, we'll follow you anywhere. Right? Like, this, this isn't some resounding commendation of Jesus. It's more of a what else are we going to do type of faith. Where else are we going to go type of faith. It's not the strongest faith we've ever seen displayed, but it's faith just the same. And the object of the faith is Jesus. Those transformed by Jesus sometimes display commendable faith, but all the more important, beating this horse, beating this drum, is the object of your faith. All sorts of people are changed in the Gospels. All sorts of people in this room have been changed by Jesus, but the change agent never changes. It's always Jesus. Father, today we are helpless, hopeless apart from you. Will you meet us in this space with yourself? Might we have renewed faith or renewed direction that you would become the object of our faith again and again and again as we are prone to wander. We sang that today. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Might we today, like the hymn says, here's our hearts, take and seal them. Will you make us have faith in you? Will you make us see you, right? That, that the things of this earth the other things that would compete to be the objects of our faith would grow strangely dim in the light of Jesus' glory and grace. It's in his name we pray. Amen.